Good evening and welcome back to Vegas October 1 Sounds. Tonight I'm going to go over the acoustics uh, that are typically encountered in an open rifle range. And why? Well, you know, that issue has come up recently which I felt was kind of abused. So let's go into it. Uh, you know, a typical range, y you have stations in which people operate and they're, they're not too far apart so you certainly hear their their gunfire and then depending upon what you're trying to do you'll, you'll have one, you know 25, 50, 100, 200 and sometimes even further targets downrange. So in um, addressing this situation you'll have a you, typically you know you'll have your table here where you have all your rests and everything and your gun is laid out on the table and whatnot with your resting bag and everything, and you'll fire a bullet. And that bullet will go down range and uh, it may encounter a, a target of some type, or it may miss it. And then, you know, if it misses it or goes through the target, we'll end up in the dirt back here, make some little bitty dust. Now, for the situation where you got somebody recording you, you know, they're typically not too far away. Let's say, you know, maybe like 20 feet away and they're kind of back of you. Or maybe they're even really straight back of you so they can see a lot of the action. So in either case for camera position, either directly in back of you or to the side of you, you're really, re the camera is really, really close. And because of that, the sounds you're going to hear are going to be very, very loud. But the question is, what sounds are recorded? Well, since you're close, you probably even hear, you know, the cocking of the gun and things like that. But from the the uh, point of what the camera records from the external ballistics, let's talk strictly of um, the muzzle blast, the supersonic crack, and and the sound of the bullet hitting the target or missing and when those sounds are heard. Well, the um, let's talk first of the muzzle blast. For these camera positions, it's again pretty straightforward in that the um, sound of the of the uh, gases coming out of the gun, you know, creates these little things that kinda are spheres that kinda, you know, expand out in all directions, but they're not truly uh, equal in all directions. As a general rule, if you have a shooter right where I'm drawing, then the sound level for that shooter in re relative to the position will end up being like you'll have really strong sound directly in front and then it'll drop down and there'll be another lobe like that and maybe another lobe until and then in back it'll come in and kind of be quiet and come back out and it'll be kind of symmetrical and you end up with this lobe. Yeah, that kind of looks like somebody flipping somebody off, I agree. So anyway, directly behind the shooter is one of the weakest spots in terms of sound. Directly in front of the shooter is the biggest and off to these oblique angles. You know, it varies. If you know you happen to end up right at this one, it's going to be a little bit less than these over there. But it's not equal in all directions is the point. It's it's kind of, it, actually it's not kind of, it's very directional. And when you're close, it matters. And actually when you're far, it matters too. Uh, but in terms of timing, uh, it doesn't really matter how loud it is. It's going to be pretty straightforward. Um, nothing more than, you know, the distance from the tip, tip of the gun. Oops. That wasn't very nice. <laughs> uh, from the tip of the gun, the distance to there to your camera divided by the speed of sound. And so it's going to arrive very, very quick. You know, if that's 20 feet, then that's only 20 milliseconds. And the same is true here. It's going to arrive, you know, just a little bit shorter time because it's a little bit shorter distance. But because there's a person here, you know, operating the gun and everything, you're probably going to have a lot more of the sound block. So if you were to uh, look at the graph, if you were to look at the amplitude plot of the sound recorded, you'd see this blip 
you know, it kind of goes like that, maybe. Or if there's lots of oscillation, you see them along there somewhere. Uh, and now you say, well, what happened to the supersonic crack? Well, that's a very good question. Because if we were to draw the supersonic crack, remember, it's produced by the bullet. And, you know, let's draw it as though it hit the object down here, and let's draw a mock, a, a mock, a supersonic cone based upon about a Mach 2 average speed of the bullet. So 20 some degrees. Now you notice I'm drawing this line. It doesn't go all the way back to where this camera is. And that's purposeful. Because the direction of the propagation of the shock waves produced by a supersonic projectile travel, the direction of uh, propagation or travel is perpendicular to the leading edge of the shock cone. So that means that the waves of the shock cone are propagating at right angles to its leading edge that way and that way, which is forward and outwards, not backwards. And so the earliest signal that was a uh, shock wave that was produced right here, uh, you know, if you were to draw this perpendicular line here and extend it back, would precisely intercept it there. And that would be the furthest region in which the a camera could be placed that received the full impact of the shock cone. Well, what is this poor slob back there here? What he hears is the bleeding or leakage of this sound right there as it comes back in a, a almost a spherical thing at a substantially reduced uh, volume. Okay, but since it traveled the exact same path the muzzle wave did, namely this one, then it arrives at the same time as the muzzle wave. So then you might see something that goes on top of it come down like that. So you would graphically see one wave. They'd be two different frequencies but one, you know, one one wave at the same time, so we'd end up looking like something like, uh, maybe, uh, you know, something like that. Come down and out, not like that. So when you have a recording from behind, and it's even worse for the one directly behind, because you know, again, the path of the shock wave has to be the same path as the muzzle blast in this case, and it's going to try to go through the gun of the shooter and then back to the recording devices. And remember that supersonic cracks, being much higher in frequency, don't go around objects as well as, they don't bend around objects as well as the muzzle blast. So that also is going to reduce the amplitude of the signal back there. But for these oblique angles, you probably will get something of lesser value. But when you get right to um, this location out here, if the camera or anywhere along this line, then it would receive a very large signal. And that's extremely important to remember when you're trying to figure out what the sound at a, a shooting range involves. Now typically these signals are not very clean. They typically end up being all over the place and die out and you know go on a long time because there's always reflection involved with the, the the things surrounding it, particularly if the range uses uh, dividers of any size, then the sounds produced here bounce around inside here until there's almost nothing uh, clean whatsoever. And so the signal is just totally and terribly obscured. The other factor is um, trying to not erase everything. And that looks pretty good. The other factor is, in this scenario, the signal is often so loud that it exceeds the capacity of the device to record, and you get what's called clipping. So, for example, if we had a signal that was just huge like this, we'd have a flat bottom and probably a flat top which is the typical response of modern electronics to a signal that's too large to record. It just flattens it and quits record. The maximum value that can be recorded is this and this. 
and that clipping then you don't know what happened up here it could have gone straight up it could have gone multiples like that it could have done anything down here you know there could have been 15 different waves down here but you would never know because they're above the maximum recording level so when there's clipping involved which is very typical when you're this close to it uh, you lose a tremendous amount of information and actually the signal beyond this point is more characteristic of the response to this clipping than it is of the actual signal itself. <coughs> but you can still see when when things start. You know, if you wanted to look at it from, well, when did the signal start? It's still pretty clear when it started. You may not be able to get the exact frequency, and it's also pretty clear, you know, after a while when it dies down, but anything in between is very nebulous. All right, so that covers what the signal looks like when you're recording from behind. So let's change up the scenario. Let's try to get out. To, okay, we don't need that line. All right, we don't need that one, that one. Now, let's say we have a camera recording location somewhere down range. Well, where are you going to be downrange at a, at, a, at a target shooting range? Man, I don't even know. But I bet it's going to be somewhere off to the side. Certainly not going to be behind unless there's a trench back there, in which case, you know, the acoustics are all messed up. But if you're somewhere over here, let's say, it could be left or right. Now let's go to a different color. Let's go to blue for this one. Over here, and the bullet hits the target, it's going to produce a sound and that sound is going to propagate back to you at the speed of sound and it gets recorded and so that's the hit sound at the same time you know the muzzle blast comes over from the muzzle goes directly to you so it gets recorded and then the supersonic crack you know is the is uh, produced remember now the sound from the fr produced by the, the sonic cone is intercepting you at right angles therefore the line drawn from you at a right angle to the mock angle intercepts it there so this is where the supersonic crack was generated that you record and so the arrival time of that supersonic crack is this distance divided by the speed of the bullet plus this distance at the s divided by the speed of sound. So you got three things to record here. So which one comes first, which one comes second, and which one comes last? Well there's kind of a lot of variables here, but two things are for sure. In this scenario you're closer to the the target than you are to the gun and therefore the blue line, i.e. the sound of the um, uh, bullet hitting that will come before the sound of the muzzle retort. So the first thing you're going to plot on this graph here is oops, is the sound of the hit and then sometime later the sound of the muzzle retort. Okay, and uh, depending on what the target's made of, the sound could actually sound like a supersonic crack if it's a very stiff piece of metal, or it can sound uh, like a, a muzzle blast if it's a softer piece of something. But anyway, there's going to be two, and depending upon how close you are, the sound of the hit to the target could actually be substantially louder than the muzzle retort. In this case, I've drawn them about equal you know, whether that's representative of, of any particular situation or not, um, who knows. Now, the thing we know about the um, supersonic crack is that it always comes before or at the same time as the muzzle. Well, here's the muzzle, but where it, when does the supersonic crack come in? Okay, well, in this scenario, we can see that the propagation time from where the supersonic crack is generated to this recording location is just a little bit shorter than the, the propagation time 
um, of the the uh, sound of the target being hit. So we start off, but then we have to add in this time over here, which is the length of the time the bullet traveled. So, you know, depending upon how close you are to the bullet, you could get um, a supersonic crack that comes in ahead of here at or after. And in each case, the supersonic crack uh, is still ahead of the muzzle blast. But the point is, you're going to have three sounds recorded. And a very common scenario is that the supersonic crack arrives at the same time as the muzzle blast. Very common. And that occurs when you're close to, closer to the uh, bullet path itself. And so in that case, and then you'll get um, a muzzle retort. So you can't just arbitrarily say that the first sound you hear is the crack because obviously it could be in the scenario where the crack where the supersonic crack is over there it could be the sound of the hit and so you have to be very careful in identifying the timing of the things and the only thing you can say for sure is that the muzzle retort will always occur last unless you happen to be um let's see if you're oh golly um if you're way up close to the shooter, then uh, the sound of the muzzle retort would hit you prior to the, the time at which the, uh, <coughs> pardon me, the sound of the hit occurs. So, once again, it's relative to the camera area, but you're going to have three sounds, and perhaps it'll sound like two if you're down close to the target. So, once again, you can't just arbitrarily say that the first sound is so-and-so without knowing, either in this case or in the case of where the camera is back there or anywhere. You have to do the timings. And without doing the timings, without knowing where the position is and knowing these distances, uh, you know, you're generally going to end up saying the wrong things. And I brought this all up uh, once again because of what... Uh, Dub and uh, Thumper were doing in their, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, in their little video about um, identifying sounds in a, a range, shooting range environment, and then just arbitrarily saying that the first sound they heard was either this or that. You don't know until you know the distances, and they didn't provide the distances or anything. Okay, well, that's you know, a little bit upon the dynamics of this and timing of the sound at a range. And we'll grab you in the next one.